The winningest team in baseball also has the most saves, and people who save the most money are winners. So start earning saves by investing in worthy bonds for only $10 each. These bonds earn a fixed 7% APY, and there's no fees, penalties, or minimum balance required, and they can be redeemed whenever you like. You can even round up everyday purchases to buy additional bonds. Go to worthybonds.com backslash save. That's worthybonds.com backslash save and save and win. Welcome to Let's Talk About It with Janelle King. I am Janelle King, and this is Extra 106.3, and this is where we discuss kitchen table topics that are banned from family gatherings, like politics and religion. And we do it, and we talk about these topics because it is necessary for a strong republic. And so I am not afraid to do that, and I'm going to keep it moving and keep having these conversations. That being said, today we're doing something a little different. So before the podcast was moved into a radio show, um, I did something called presidential breakdowns. And it was just really important to me that we look at these candidates, right? I feel excited. I get excited when I get to participate. I feel like in politics over the years, all the fun, fun stuff happened when we were, um, I don't know, it just kind of happened when I was young and I was unable to really participate. Like, for instance, there was somebody who said, you know, they were talking about AI and they were like, oh, my gosh, you know, AI is going to be a certain going to be so bad. And this is and I'm thinking to myself, like, man, I am actually trying to get in on this early. Like, I want to know what's going on, because when Y2K occurred, I was a teenager. So. Everybody else was talking about, you know, was freaking out because they felt like the, all the computers were going to crash because everything stopped in 1999. There was not, they didn't know what 2000 was going to look like. And it's hard to believe now that we're in 2023 that that was ever a real concern, but it really was. And I remember all the adults at the time was just kind of freaking out about it, but I wasn't able to participate. So now that I'm old enough to participate in things and I'm aware and I got a little bit of experience under my belt, just a little, I I get excited about these things. And so we're going to do some presidential breakdowns. So if you missed the past breakdowns that I've done, I did do a replay during the summer and that was with Vivek Ramaswamy. And what I do during these breakdowns is... I find interviews or I find little video clips and stuff that is um, that I believe is something that is going to give us a good insight into what this candidate believes in and what this candidate p- plans to do. And then I kind I, I, I clip it up. So I don't I don't want to I can't show the entire interview. Right. I can't play the entire interview. Just don't have enough time. So I'll find segments of the interview that I think are pretty interesting and then in those segments what I would do is take that part and I don't clip up that segment right so what you're going to hear is a question and then you're going to hear the president's response and the person that I am breaking down today is President Trump so like I said I did Vivek Ramaswamy in the past I did Nikki Haley and then uh, Governor Ron DeSantis and all of those are on my podcast where this will be going on Tuesday which is the following Following Tuesday after you know after you're listening to this so that's when you can listen to all of this without any breaks how do I do this I like to find important topics that are important to the American people topics that are either at top concern or these are issues and, and, and concerns that we're all talking about and then I take the president or the candidate's response to that and that's how I do this and this is my way of trying to be fair because you know every every conversation is different every interview is different and uh so and it's kind of hard sometimes to like make sure that you're balancing it out so I do it by topics and so there are certain topics that I think pertain more to certain candidates and I kind of like to harp on that a little bit too but why is this important this is super important to me because I still believe that we the people like we the people are the ones that's going to have to save the country it's not It's not um, something that's going to take place by one individual or a few individuals. Like, this is legit a real 
group effort that has to take place. Right now, we have 435 members of the House and I think 100, yeah, 100 members in the Senate. So we have allowed 535 people to influence our decisions, our plans, and ultimately our quality of life. 535 individuals who we decided were worthy of that position. We put them there. I feel like we have to begin by talking about how we have been reduced to 30 second sound bites. I feel like the reason why this is important and why we need to do these breakdowns is because so many people are watching what's happening through um, through social media and through these mi- like miniature or little small clips. I feel like we're not paying attention in the ways that we should. And it's all of us because we're all a bit distracted. I also feel like the electorate is all over the place. Like there are people who care a lot about election integrity. There are people who care about the economy. There's people who care about education. There's people who care about a variety of different things. And sometimes I feel like we have a hard time coming together and bringing all of our stuff to the table and looking to see which candidate addresses those issues collectively versus supporting the candidate that you think just that, that, that supports what you are interested in. We got to look at making sure we elect people that can have a collective approach. And I don't think we're researching our candidates enough. There used to be a time where websites where you would just either go to the website or even before that, obviously there was before websites and there was other methods, but I'm most familiar with the method of utilizing the website. So where every candidate have their own website. And then in that website, they will share what it is that they do, what do they plan to do, what do they believe, where do they stand, what are their issues, all that good stuff. And I feel like our websites are getting very, very lean these days, and I'm not seeing that. When my husband ran for U.S. Senate, it was really important to us to have a page on our website that showed and shared exactly where he stood on particular issues. And I don't think we just do that enough. Today, I feel like decisions are being driven by notoriety and not ideas it's who do you know the most not who has the best ideas not who has the best solutions but who do you know the most who has the most name recognition who can raise the most money in my opinion i believe that in today's formula the winnable candidate are people who are about 60 percent charismatic 30 percent fundraising and then i leave that last 10 percent for policy and ideas And the reason why I believe that is because I hear a lot about how much you like a person or how much you like what this person is doing as it relates to how they're campaigning. Then I find, then the next goes, well, who's raising the most money? Who's raising the most money and who's leading in the polls? Then I hear about their ideas. A lot of the candidates that are running, I I couldn't tell you what they're running on. I know what they're running for, but what are you running on? And this is why I think it's extremely important to research. I'm really tired of hearing excessive talking points and talking points for the sake of just talking points. I want to challenge our candidates to provide honest assessments. I really want, I want our, I want to challenge our candidates and I want to provide honest assessments. I want to make sure that when I am talking to a particular candidate or when I am even associated with politics, that I am in, in, in going into this, making sure I'm coming in with the honest assessment. And if we don't do it, the left will. If we don't vet our own candidates, the left will do it for us. And it would be very ugly because they spare none. In some cases, they will make up stuff. And we couldn't counter it because we haven't done our due diligence. So we can't say, no, that's not right. Because when I did my own op research or when I did my own vetting, I found this. We can't even say that because we're not doing it. So you kind of have to take their word for it. And we saw this happen um, in 2020. And in Lee, and, and we saw this happen in this past election with our Senate race. And it just really leads to catastrophic consequences. When we have people who are like, OK, I'm going to just pick the person based on what I want, like I, how I feel today, not on what they can do or what they're trying to do or what they stand for. There's a lot of people who voted for Joe Biden simply because they were tired of Trump. And now they're like, I want Trump back. That's why his numbers are so high. Because there are a lot of people who were just upset with the decision that they made. Well, I haven't picked a candidate. I haven't picked a candidate as of yet. 
my, neither my husband and I haven't. We have a little system in our house. We don't cancel out votes, so we vote. Our house is two votes, so whoever we support, we're going to support it. We, we, we support the same person every single time because we don't cancel out our votes. And I, I haven't picked anybody because I'm actually doing my due diligence. And I want you to go on this journey with me as we are researching each and every candidate of interest, the one, mainly the ones that really are showing that they have an opportunity, have a chance. And I, and I say that because I am doing research on the others. Um, and if I find something really cool or unique, I'll bring it to you. But because we have so many candidates, I don't want to do a show on everybody. So I'm going to do a show on probably the top six that make it to the or seven or whoever makes it to the debate stage. But I am doing research on everybody else. And some of them I've already ruled out as not an option for me. But that's just me. So we're going to be reviewing full interviews and responses because I want to make sure that I practice what I preach. And we have to go back. We, ha- we have to get focused in on this because we do have to take our country back. We got to do it by doing our homework. We got to stop, you know, listening to these narratives and start driving the narrative by pushing candidates to be better, to put forth people who are policy focused. And after the break, I am going to start playing a couple of clips and then I'll give my commentary. And then we're going to play another clip and kind of go back and forth. I really found it to be really difficult to find a full interview with President Trump. So, and I don't really like clips. So I wanted to make sure I found entire responses. And so what you're going to hear are question and responses from the most recent CNN town hall that took place a few months ago. And I'm going to add just my personal opinion on some of the answers. And there's something that happened during this that was a bit shocking. By doing this research, and this is why I encourage it, I discovered something that happened under the Trump administration that I did not know about. And I'm going to share that with you. Um, Again, this is called vetting. This is what we do. We're not taking anybody's word for it. We're not picking people because of their name recognition or because we like them. We're going to do our research and we're going to actually be people who care about this country and who care about who's leading it because it's up to us. So stay tuned. We're going to take a quick. The winningest team in baseball also has the most saves and people who save the most money are winners. So start earning saves by investing in worthy bonds for only $10 each. These bonds earn a fixed 7% APY, and there's no fees, penalties, or minimum balance required, and they can be redeemed whenever you like. You can even round up everyday purchases to buy additional bonds. Go to worthybonds.com backslash save. That's worthybonds.com backslash save, and save and win. Spring is here, and baseball is back. You can't forget the derby. I love the hats. Do you have yours yet? My hat? I treated myself to a whole outfit. If you want to be able to treat yourself, then you should check out the Nest Savings Account at LGE Community Credit Union, where they want you to reach your savings goals faster. Take it from a pair of 680 The Fan wives. Head to lgeccu.org to find out what makes their team number one in Georgia. Break. And then I'll be right back. Welcome back to Let's Talk About It with Janelle King. I am Janelle King, and this is Extra 106.3. If you want to hear the playback, I drop the playback, the full episode, on my podcast every Tuesday. You can get it everywhere you receive your podcast, or you can go to allthingsjking.com. That's allthingsjking.com. And so before the break, I discussed the importance of doing your research and why we got to do these candidate breakdowns, why I'm doing this for myself, and I'm bringing you on this journey. While I'm really looking into people people's answers and responses and doing research because the Democrats are going to do it for us, as I stated before. And when they do it, they control the narrative. And most importantly, we have to make sure that we get away from electing people who have the name and money, but have very little solutions because it only frustrates us later. We got to start thinking about it from that perspective. And I get the theory, right? The theory is that if this person has a lot of name recognition, chances are there are a lot of people that's going to vote for them simply because of their name. Well, that's not necessarily what's happening. I mean, people typically vote based on what that person says or does at that moment. And 
not what they have done in the past. So we got to get back to electing people who have solutions. I want to find a good can that has good ideas. And then from there, we throw a whole bunch of money behind them so that they can get their message out. And then we build name recognition or we are grateful that they already have name recognition. But I just think the process is a little weird. So let's get started. So I'm using the CNN town hall that was quite controversial. I mean, the Democrats didn't like it and some of the Republicans didn't either. So I think this was perfect, right? So in these clips, you're going to hear a question and the response, and then I'll come back with my personal opinion. So let's start with the first question around the economy and raising of the debt ceiling. Hi, Mr. President. Hi, uh, so my question is, what do you think about the United States current debt situation and how can we move forward? Uh, such an important question. So we're at $33 trillion, a number that nobody ever thought possible. When we had our economy rocking and rolling just prior to COVID coming in, like literally, we were making a fortune. And oil, we were going to make so much money from oil, we were going to start paying off debt. But then with COVID coming in, we had to do other things. We had to keep this country alive because it was so serious. But we have to get the country back. We have to lower energy prices. We have to lower interest rates. Interest rates are through the roof. Energy has to come down. It all has to come down. And we have to start paying off debt. But when we have a debt limit, and they use that very seriously to me. They came in, Schumer came in with Nancy Pelosi, and they were using it. We'll violate it. We'll do whatever. They talked a whole lot different than they do right now. I say to the Republicans out there, congressmen, senators, if they don't give you massive cuts, you're going to have to do a default. And I don't believe they're going to do a default because I think the Democrats will absolutely cave because you don't want to have that happen. But it's better than what we're doing right now because we're spending money like drunken sailors. So you know just to expression? be clear, Mr. President, you think the U.S. should default if the White House does not agree to the spending cuts Republicans well, are demanding? We might as well do it now because you'll do it later because we have to save this country. Our country is dying. I feel like the economy and the raising of the debt ceiling and anything that's money focused, it's really it's really the president's sweet spot, right? He's a businessman. That is where that that's where he is like really, really good. And all of the answers, I believe this out of all of the answers that he provided, I think this was the best and it was to be expected because one thing he said was either you default now or you default later. What we found when well, now that this is in hindsight, we know that the, um, that our, uh, Senate our house that they they actually vote and they, they agree to um, not necessarily raise the debt ceiling but to kick it down the, down the road like to kind of I guess they are leaving it where it is or the possibility of raising it or maybe they are raising it but either way they're, they're planning to address this later which is kind of spot on with what he said like either you default now or default later I think raising the debt ceiling during his term or during during a Republican's term is it is is I mean I'm sorry defaulting during that time I think that is most important because for me the reason why I agree with Speaker McCarthy and I really was like you know what I think we do need to just go ahead and do it for right now I mean it's like what what the heck all right we're already a 31 trillion in debt it's only going to get a little bit worse I mean but good lord like we're so far gone at this point where that it's going to take an act of God and, and and really getting rid of some of these departments in order to really address this issue but that being said the reason why I agree with McCarthy, even though I, I learned a few weeks back, and we'll talk about that, that default was not necessarily going to be the worst scenario, but I didn't know what the fallout would be. I didn't know what the narrative would be. I didn't know how they were going to manage this because they were they going to turn it into a crisis or pretend like nothing's happening. I don't trust this administration to manage it properly because I don't trust Biden. I feel like Biden is so engulfed in himself and in whatever his family's racketeering and whatever they're allegedly running. But... I, I just believe that we needed to just wait until we had better leadership in order to deal with this. And I did an interview a while back with John Marsh, who's like our constitutional expert that I bring on from time to time. And he helped me to understand that what would have happened if we had defaulted. And he said that it would not have been as bad as I thought, because basically what he was saying is that. You know, it's almost like defaulting on a credit card. You know, it's just when you default, you just can't borrow anymore, right? So you just have to work with what you have. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. I think we do need to get to that point. And I, I feel confident that we will get to that point. But I still believe that 
the right decision was made, mostly because they kicked it down the road. And I'm just hoping that we can address all of this in 2024 and hoping that we can decide uh, that we do decide to default and that we have better leadership that can manage it properly. And so, okay, I definitely agree with the president on this one. I think he did great on that answer. So let's go to the next question, which is about Ukraine. Hello, President Trump. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Um, The current administration has made it clear that we should continue to provide military equipment to Ukraine so that they can defend themselves. Do you support this decision? And how would you deal with the increasing threat posed by Vladimir Putin? First of all, thank you very much. It's really nice. And it's an important question, so important, because we're giving away so much equipment. We don't have ammunition for ourselves right now. We don't have ammunition for ourselves. We're giving away so much. But here's the thing. I have to say it to start off. No longer matters. If I were president, this would have never happened. And even the Democrats admit that. Putin knew it would have never happened. And his pipeline would have never happened. A lot of things would have never happened. But this Which would Democrats never have happened. That, and Mr. all those president? dead people, both Russian and Ukrainian, it would, they wouldn't be dead today. And all those cities that are blown up and disintegrated right to the ground, that wouldn't have happened. OK. Now, here's the problem. We've given so far $171 billion. I think the question was really around spending, right? Like, would would you spend more money in order to help Ukraine? And we didn't really get that. The answer we got was it would it would have never happened if I was president. OK, that's all great, fine and dandy. But I want to know, will you spend more or less? I personally don't have a side on this one because while I, I do think that we are spending too much money and we're sending too much to Ukraine, I feel like I don't have enough information. I have my theories and I have my, I, 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 I kind of understand what's going on, but I don't. So I'm hoping that we will do our due diligence and elect somebody who's going to, do, after doing the research, who will go in there, really assess the situation, determine what needs to be done. Because I kind of see it from both sides. I don't quite know what's going on over there. And I know we have some people that are, that we recently elected that are, you know, aware of this stuff. And when I spoke with them, they were saying that, you know, we do need to make sure we continue to help Ukraine. So I personally, I may have my own personal feelings about it, but I don't, I'm not going to say that I'm looking for him to say, no, I'm not going to send any money, but I am looking for you to answer the question. I don't feel like the question was answered here. Something that he did go on to say, though, was that he would negotiate. And that means what? More spending could happen? What are you going to negotiate? What is, at least tell me what's on your end of the deal, right? Because if you're going to go in and negotiate, there's something that you want. So I think that would be an opportunity for him to share that. I get that, I'm sorry, I get that you don't want to give premature answers, but I'm not understanding why we're just not answering the question directly, right? So... Like I said, you don't have to answer the question prematurely, completely, in its entirety. But I I, I do want to know where you stand on things, even if you were to say, well, I just don't want to do this or I just feel like I, you know, I don't know. I just kind of feel like there's more that could have been said here. And I wanted to hear him say more, um, you know, like no more money. There are other ways of support. That's something he could have done. Or I would give them X amount of dollars or more and ensure that they're fully stabilized and then no more than that. Or I don't know. I don't know what exactly I wanted to hear, but I think I don't think that the answer I got was completely I don't know. I don't think it's what I really wanted. So, you know, we all have our perspectives. What's yours? You know, what do you think about that one? Personally, I think that Trump would spend more money if it was necessary. I mean, he talked about his relationship with Zelensky and that, you know, he will do all that he can. And I believe that means that he would, you know, spend more if that was necessary. Okay, so let's move on to the next question and this one is about gun rights and this is where i am a little confused with gun violence and mass shootings in the news cycle recently i'm worried that state governments and the federal government are going to act to repress gun rights Uh, under your administration you uh, instructed the department of justice and the atf to ban bump stocks if elected president again how would you act not only to defend our second amendment rights but to restore rights that have been taken from us um, such as by example recently the atf's ruling on the pistol stabilizing braces yeah, as you know, the bump stocks are actually a very un- 
important thing. And NRA, I went with them, and they said, it doesn't mean anything. Or actually, all they do is teach you how to shoot very inaccurately. So we did that. Uh, there's been nobody that's protected the Second Amendment, as you know, like I have. I've protected it through thick and thin, not easy to do. But we have a very big mental health problem in this country. And again, it's not the gun that pulls the trigger. It's the person that pulls the trigger. He started out by saying that you banned bump stops. And for those who didn't, for those of you who don't know, because I was a little confused, I didn't know what he was referring to. So apparently in 2017, in the, after the Las Vegas mass shooting, during a music festival in Los, on the Las Vegas strip, strip, a lone gunman by the name of Stephen Paddock opened fire from the 34, the 32nd floor in the Mandalay Bay Hotel and they shot you know into a crowd of concert goers below and as a result the Trump administration issued a ban on bump stops and this is a device that allowed firearms to mimic automatic weapons and apparently the Department of Justice the DOJ issued a rule in 2018 categorizing bump stops as machine guns under the existing firearms laws so during this, a 90-day period had been initiated on individuals, and they basically had 90 days to turn over their bump stops that they possessed and either turn them into the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms and Explosives, or ATF, or destroy them. Gun right activists filed a lawsuit because they said that, you know, they want to stop the enforcement of this rule which because it contained an exhibit including preliminary investigative reports that showed that this right here is not fair for people who had already owned them prior to the shooting. Ultimately, the ban was struck down, and the court argued that allowing the executive branch to both interpret and enforce criminal statutes poses a risk to individual liberty, and that the judiciary should play a role in interpreting criminal laws. In other words, you decided to categorize this product as a machine gun in 2018, but the people who purchased it beforehand did it lawfully. So why do they have to turn over anything and why do they have to destroy their product or whatever they're using? I did my research on this and I was like, man, this is really interesting. So it's still legal in Georgia. And then something else that happened because, you know, Trump kind of brushed over it, right? He was just kind of like, oh, it was a bad idea. It was this and And the NRA was supporting and all that. And turns out, I mean, the NRA was not on board. And I don't think, so that wasn't necessarily true because the NRA experienced that they were disappointed in the ban, stating that it fails to address, as I stated before, law-abiding citizens who acquire bump stops uh, based on prior ATF determinations. Let's go back to the question around protecting our Second Amendment, Second Amendment rights. I feel some type of way that I didn't know about this. I'm not blaming the president because I don't, I don't know if he's hit it or anything like that, but because I'm like, why are we even creating these type of bans? Um, I, do I think that there needs to be something addressed as it relates to what What's happening when it comes to gun violence? Absolutely. I think it's done by addressing the mental health aspect of it, not the weapon. So the fact that there was a ban on a weapon or, or a ac accessory, not even the weapon, but on the accessory, I feel like either it was I'm trying to appease over here and by not, you know, upsetting people over here. I don't know what that was, but I don't necessarily like that. And I really don't like the idea of saying that the NRA was on board when they weren't. So I did like the way he pivoted to the mental health and acknowledged that the person is the problem and not the weapon. That really did stand out to me, and I really appreciated that. That was kind of my favorite part of the what was the solution. My favorite part was hearing that, and I look for solutions. Something else that he said was he talked about hardening our schools. And in Georgia, there are a few schools that are gun trained. The staff is gun trained. And I wanted to see... Uh, I want to see that throughout the country. I do think that that's a way of being... That's helping us to put ourselves in a position where our children are still protected. Um, it, it, I, I think people will be less to run up in a school when they know that there will be other weapons inside and that people are trained to use them. And that's just my my perspective. He also mentioned Brazil and Chicago, and I think he made some really good points there, although I do think we overuse those points sometimes. I think there's so many other angles that we can come from, like really harping on the mental health side and hardening the schools, which is what he did mention that I really like. Overall, I feel like he answered it before the question was asked. 
I think he believes in the Second Amendment and protecting it. I don't like what he did with the bump stops. I have to say that. I don't like it at all. And I don't like that we're not talking about it um, because we will be quick to talk about it if it came from the left. But, you know, I'm open to it and making adjustments like... I saw like 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 making some of these adjustments are necessary, but I just don't want us banning anything. I don't want to ban anything that's associated with the actual weapon because that's not the problem. The problem are the people and mental health issues, and we need to address that. Let's go to the next topic, which is and then we're going to save the last topic for after the commercial break. But let's just talk about this topic, which is on winning women that he lost although Roe v. Wade has been overturned. How do you plan to appeal to women voters in New Hampshire who are concerned about the Dobbs decision and how states may change their laws? It's such a great question and it was such a great victory and people are starting to understand it now. Uh, you know that they wanted to bring it back to the states but that was probably the least important part of that victory. Getting rid of uh, Roe v. Wade was an incredible thing for pro-life because it gave pro-life something to negotiate with. Pro-life had absolutely nothing being stuck in Roe v. Wade to negotiate with. And now what's happening, and I see it all over, uh, deals are being made, deals are going to be made, and look, everybody that was president wanted to get rid and tried to get rid of Roe v. Wade for 50 years. Republicans. For 50 years, this has been going on. Actually, a couple of Democrats, too. But for 50 years, this has been going on. I was able to do it, and I was very honored to do it. But by doing it, things are happening that are very, very positive. And you have to, I happen to believe in the exceptions, the life of the mother, rape, incest, like Ronald Reagan believed in the exceptions. But I happen to believe that. I think it, I think it's frankly important to do that, but a lot of people are, uh, you know, against that. A, sm- a relatively small, relatively small number, but the so way I, I the way I look, I think it's very important to say this. I consider the other side to be radical because the other side, under Roe v. Wade and other things, the other side, they're radical because they will remember the debate with Hillary Clinton. I said, rip the baby out of the womb at the end of the ninth month. They will kill the baby in the ninth month. If you look at that crazy governor of Virginia from the former governor, where he said, no, the baby will be born, and then we'll decide essentially whether or not to execute the baby. Okay, so the question was really about targeting the woman vote. And the reason why is because President Trump is hemorrhaging the woman vote. A lot of my friends, what I'm noticing is that the husbands are still hanging on to Trump and the wives are gone. (laughs) Like, it's like, this is really happening. It's a thing. And I find that to be quite interesting. It's typically a house divided. And I don't think it's because of abortion. I don't. I don't think it's because of the abortion topic, because President Trump has made it very clear that he is um, supportive of abortion as it relates to um, exceptions. Like, he's pro-life, but he does believe in exceptions. So he's made that very clear. Um... But I don't think that this is the reason why he's losing the female vote. I think he's having trouble with the female vote and women's vote because we are just not wired the same. Like we are wired to where we just we can't take a whole lot of craziness and like fighting and backbiting over and over and over again. You know, I just think that it's more of his energy and less of the abortion topic. Now, I mean, because people who are pro-life are going to be pro-life. People who are pro-choice are going to be pro-choice. And we have had a lot of pro-choice. Republicans in the party who still vote Republican and just they just kind of put that to the side and so I don't know if that's what I would say Um, I think the Democrats want to put this on the ballot I think they want this to be a topic but as Republicans we believe in states rights so I don't support a national abortion ban politically personally now morally absolutely I would love to see something like that but politically I just believe in freedom and I believe in states rights and you know even the Lord has given us free will and um, it said you know what morally I wish that God would force all of us to love him but he didn't he allowed us to have the option to choose right from wrong and I I just kind of stand on that unfortunately our constitution supports life i'm I'm sorry not unfortunately that's weird fortunately our constitution supports life um but it doesn't say anything about abortion and that's the unfortunate part so you know there was nothing 
there's nothing that says anything about that. So I was excited to hear where the president would stay on this issue. And going back to my original point, just giving us some more perspective, you know, he does believe in pro-life. He is pro-life, but he's pro-life with exceptions. So for the people who are anti that, that who believe in just 100% pro-life, I mean, I'm one of those people. I don't believe in the exceptions. And I have my own reasons for that because, you know, like I said, my husband, mom was 15 when she had him. He was born one year after Roe v. Wade was passed. And I'm so grateful he was not aborted, as well as my bonus son was born when Kelvin was 19 so you know there I I understand that there are circumstances that are unfavorable and just feels like it's not right in the right timing but you know I don't know and then I had a roommate I had a college roommate her sibling was was conceived out of rape and mom decided to still give birth and now he's doing great he's a father and you know it's just I don't know I I just I don't believe in exceptions for that very reason but that's just me but I would not vote for him or not support somebody because they do believe in exceptions um, because I just it goes back to that state's rights and I believe that we are going to see that take precedent so honestly I didn't feel like he gave a solution but I did feel like he gave me some perspective and I did appreciate that and so when asked about the federal ban you know we got another negotiating response because you know he said that we'll we'll see we'll see we'll see but again I kind of want to know where do you stand on this issue that being said all right we're going to roll in the next one in the next segment so if you're listening to let's talk about the winningest team in baseball also has the most saves and people who save the most money are winners so start earning saves by investing in worthy bonds for only ten dollars each these bonds earn a fixed seven percent apy and there's no fees penalties or minimum balance required and they can be redeemed whenever you like you can even round up everyday purchases to buy additional bonds. Go to worthybonds.com backslash save. That's worthybonds.com backslash save and save and win. It's March and we all know what that means. College basketball. I know there are teams looking for a bump, but did you know that our friends at LGE Community Credit Union have a bump rate program for their CDs? If you have a CD with them and rates increase during the term, you have one chance to bump your rate, giving you the power to earn even more. Take it from a pair of 680 The Fan wives. Head to lgeccu.org to find out what makes LGE number one in Georgia. Got it with Janelle King. I am Janelle King. Welcome back to Let's Talk About It with Janelle King. I am Janelle King. We're going to continue with what we're doing, what we're talking about, which is presidential breakdowns. I always state beforehand, if you did not catch the beginning part of the show, that's totally fine. Yes, you missed it, but it's okay. It's always okay because you can catch it in full in its entirety um, on Tuesday. And you can go to my website, allthingsjking.com to find out the best podcast for you. All right, let's just play this next one really quickly. And then we're going to finish this up. And uh, this one is about the stoning election rhetoric. Will you suspend polarizing talk of election fraud during your run for president? Yeah, unless I see election fraud. If I see election fraud, I think I have an obligation to say it. And you know what we went through uh, a short while ago has really put our country in a big problem. Uh, I hope to do that. I hope we're going to have very honest elections. Uh, We should have voter ID. We should have one day elections. We should have paper ballots instead of these mail in votes. But uh, the answer is yes, and I hope that it's going to be very straight up, because if it's going to be straight up, we're going to win the election. Okay, so this was interesting because he has spoken at a lot of rallies since this town hall. And I feel he gave the answer that the person wanted in the moment. I'm be honest. I don't think that his answer was... I should say I'm be transparent because I'm always honest. But I don't think his his answer was the most I think it was kind of like what he needed to happen at that moment right I he still talks about the 2020 election I mean we've if you've been to any of his rallies post this town hall you would see that he does and I wish he had almost said yes I'm going to go back and continue to talk about the 2020 elections and other important issues I think that's what the guy was really saying I think the guy I don't know if people really care if you rehash how you felt because we all have feelings I mean I have feelings about what happened in my husband's race and I do sometimes rehash it because it just helps you to kind of you know just put things together and really flesh out that that thought process or flesh out that thought process so 
I'm not against him talking about it, but the problem people are having is that it feels like it's the only thing you're talking about. Like you throw in other stuff, but it seems to be like take precedent in conversations. So highlighting the issue is not just a concern for this guy, but I think he wants to, I think he just wants to kind of move on. I think he feels like a lot of people are just not there anymore. We have other things that are going on. So although I agree with the answer that he gave, I do think that we should let it go to a certain degree and focus on winning in 2024. Now, that's something he said, right? He kind of, uh, uh, President Trump kind of alluded to that as well. Like, you know, and, and, and whether or not you believe it or not, the truth of the matter is there wasn't any... The Kraken is still, we're still waiting on the Kraken. I'm just going to say it like that. We're still waiting on the Kraken. Um, I'm hoping it comes forth soon if it's available. But the fact that we have very little evidence to prove that there was widespread fraud is where people are having issues with this. And please don't tell me that there was, you know, that there was widespread widespread, fraud. fraud because if there was I need you to show it to me I need you to prove it to me I really really do and so until then there's going to be a lot of people that's just going to be a little concerned I do I think that there was some irregularities absolutely do I think that the absentee ballots process went out of hand absolutely but I really just want to make sure that we are focusing in on you know going forward moving forward because if you don't have the absolute you know evidence to prove it then it's just going to be really hard to keep harping on it so something else he mentioned was voter ids um i mean personal your personal id is, is the same concept right like i mean you can't vote without having a personal id paper ballots i'm still trying to understand how paper ballots is more secure because I just feel like all we're going to do is see a bunch of people filling out these scantrons. Like, I I don't know. I I, I'm a little concerned about the paper ballot concept because I'm not understanding what that means. So that was a little bit of a concern to me to wrap all this up. Um, I, where do I stand? I didn't hear anything that I thought would hurt his campaign, but I do have some questions about some major issues. I do. Um, Nothing, maybe maybe I shouldn't say major issues because it's not that serious, but I do have some questions about where he stands on things. I want want to hear some more details as to how you're going to fix things. I don't want to take your word for it. I don't want to do that with anybody. And as I stated before, you know, we haven't picked a candidate as of yet. I am practicing what I preached. Um, I have worked in politics now for over a decade, mostly behind the scenes. And when Kelvin ran for office, I was kind of on the, I kind of got a chance to see the other side of the coin. Um, it's one thing to work for candidates. It's one thing to support candidates. It's another thing to be the candidate. And when you're a spouse, you are the candidate because a lot of what your husband's going through, you're going through as well. And I realized that there were a lot of big donors and elected officials and leaders who were endorsing without doing research of every candidate. And that was really disturbing to me because I'm wondering, what are you doing? You know, and, and I've just vowed to never, ever, ever be that person. And if I was that person in the past, I'm not going to be that person ever again. So as my platform grows, I have become more and more committed to authenticity because I believe that as I become more aware of what's happening, that's how you that that's how you you grow. Something that I've been considering doing, and I think I'm going to really, really do this, is I'm going to read through some of the bills that are being presented, and I want to review it with y'all. So I'm just going to look at some stuff. Um, I recently found out about the USDA. This is not a bill, but I recently found out about the USDA that's, you know, um, and they're people's guarding. They want you to register your community guarding, and I have some issues about that. So there's so many things that's happening behind our backs, and we don't even know, and I'm going to start looking into that type of stuff. And I also want to start watching some of these committee meetings and reporting on them as well. As I started watching the one with um, the IRS agents um, as it relates to Hunter Biden. And it was, that was very enlightening, right, by the way. But I want to listen to some of the hearings that are not getting publicized and getting TV attention. So I'm excited to continue my breakdowns. I'm actually looking for a... Um, interview, a full interview with Vice President Pence so I can do a breakdown of Vice President Pence. As I stated before, Vivek Ramaswamy, Nikki Haley, and Ron DeSantis has already been, I've already done those breakdowns. You can find those on the podcast. And so, yeah. So come on, continue to follow with me. 
continue to do your research with me and let's see what happens. Let's see what comes out of this. So, uh, yeah, I'm going to leave it there and we're going to kind of pick back up with either VP Pence, if I can find it. If not, we'll pick it back up with some other people. Thank you so much for listening to Let's Talk About It with Janelle King. I'm so appreciative. Please remember to follow me on all social media platforms. Like, share, comment, do all that stuff. Rate the podcast. It's all great for me. And it's all great for you as well, because then I know what that what I'm doing is something that you approve of and that you are enjoying. And I will continue to do it. Now, we've go, we've talked about it. Now, you go talk about it. And hey, do your own little candidate breakdowns. You know, make it fun. Do it with your family. Thank you so much once again for listening to Let's Talk About It with Janelle King. I am Janelle King, and I will see you next time. And this is Extra 106.3. The winningest team in baseball also has the most saves, and people who save the most money are winners. So start earning saves by investing in worthy bonds for only $10 each. These bonds earn a fixed 7% APY, and there's no fees, penalties, or minimum balance required, and they can be redeemed whenever you like. You can even round up everyday purchases to buy additional bonds. Go to worthybonds.com backslash save. That's worthybonds.com backslash save, and save and win. It's March, and we all know what that means. College basketball. I know there are teams looking for a bump, but did you know that our friends at LGE Community Credit Union have a bump rate program for their CDs? If you have a CD with them and rates increase during the term, you have one chance to bump your rate, giving you the power to earn even more. Take it from a pair of 680 The Fan wives. Head to lgeccu.org to find out what makes LGE number one in Georgia. Springtime is here. Looking for a fun weekend with family, friends, and the kids? The Mitsubishi Electric Classic, presented by Venture, Georgia's only PGA Tour Champions event, returns to Metro Atlanta April 26th to the 28th. Pick your favorite hole to watch along the ropes or find public seating throughout the course. Children 15 and under receive complimentary tickets with purchase by an adult. Join the excitement at TPC Sugarloaf in Duluth, Georgia, from April 26th to the 28th. Tickets available at MitsubishiElectricClassic.com slash tickets.